We continue in 2 Corinthians today, reading from chapter 7, where Paul, after speaking frankly to the Corinthians, seeks to reassure them, rejoicing over their repentance and their hospitality towards Titus, beginning in verse 2. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts, to die together and to live together. I often boast about you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with consolation. I am overjoyed in all our affliction. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted in every way, disputes without and fears within. But God, who consoles the downcast, consoled us by the arrival of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was consoled about you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. May God add God's blessing to the hearing and the reading and the understanding of these words. If you would please stand if you are able for the gospel reading. Reading from Mark chapter 6, where Jesus returns to his hometown and experiences rejection from kin and friend. He then sends out his disciples in pairs, warning them that they too will face rejection. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, Where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph, and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? and they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Do you know what we're testing, Reverend? The supervisor of the police academy asked me, uh, late one night when we were watching the exercises for these police cadets that were considered their finals. We were at an empty apartment building and, and these cadets were putting, being put through several scenarios and, and as they came out of the apartment building, really believing that they were done and that they would be evaluated on what had happened up to that point, they were suddenly and unexpectedly jumped by two other officers dressed as criminals and they began to struggle. We're not testing their skills, he said. If they didn't have those already, they wouldn't be here. We're, we're not testing their mental capabilities. If they didn't have those, they, they wouldn't already be here. We're testing two things. And one is their will to live. We need to know if, and they need to know if they can endure a struggle that feels like it will go on forever. And, and what they need to do is to keep their gun in its holster because they're taught from the very beginning that if a criminal takes their gun, they're as good as dead. So we need to know, will they keep struggling in order to survive? I, I've sometimes wondered if that might not be a, a good final exam for, for people going into the clergy. 
to test our will to survive difficult things. I'll bet you can say that about your vocation as well. Maybe you might even say that about your marriage. I don't know. What is that that need to endure, that desire to persevere, that willingness not to give up on those things which are vitally important and, and knowing when. When is the time to uh, release and move on and when is the time to hang on with everything you have in order to survive? I think in different ways, both of our scriptures today are really about that. You know with me that we've been following Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of Mark and, and that he spoke to us through parables in, in, the, in the first chapter that we dealt with this summer. And, and in those parables he talked about the, the word of God being like seeds planted on different kinds of soils and, and that when our hearts are open uh, we can yield 30, 60, even 100 times what is planted. And, and we heard Jesus tell us about how the kingdom of God is like that invasive mustard bush that you don't want to put in your garden because it'll take over everything. And that, that God's promise is that that kingdom, that God's kingdom is like that as well. And, and then we, we moved on and we watched Jesus uh, go with the disciples across the lake of Gennesaret. And, and there they are met by a man filled with a legion of demons. And, and Jesus is able to put him into his right mind and tells him to stay there so that he can minister to those who had cast him outside of community. He can offer them the good news. And they come back across the lake and we know that Jesus' robe is grabbed by that woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years and he says her faith has made her well, that she can go in peace and be healed. And, and then, then he goes to the home of the synagogue leader Jairus and, and helps to heal his daughter who everyone else assumed was dead. And so he's done all these marvelous things. He's given all these wonderful words of wisdom. And now he comes back home. Now he comes to his home synagogue. Local boy made good. And what, one might imagine that he would be welcomed with open arms. One, one might imagine that as everyone uh, knew of, of the deeds he'd been doing, because even when he told the disciples not to tell anyone, word spread to the extent that he was surrounded by thousands of people. So they had heard about him at, in his hometown as well. And, and he goes to the synagogue and he begins teaching. And initially the people are astounded. And then they look at each other and they say, well, where has this man gotten all this wisdom? Wait a minute, isn't he the, the son of Mary? The brother of, and they, they list his four brothers, James and Jonas and, and Silas and, and his sisters. And, and it's like they start thinking about it. Wait a minute, is he, is he acting like he knows more than us? You know, the, the instructions he's giving are, are like our law, but they move beyond the law that we have learned all these years in our synagogue and suddenly it says they took offense at him. Maybe you know what that's like. You leave home, you, you gain a degree or a certification or, or, or start into a job and, and, and you do very, very well and, and the people who are your peers and your colleagues and your friends in that community, they hold you in high esteem and so you go home maybe for the first time after, after everything's been going well and, and no one there seems to be that impressed. I had a good friend once who was uh, uh, the first woman to be made academic dean of a particular seminary. And so she called her mom to tell her, her mom and dad to tell them and, and said, you know, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the first woman to be named academic dean of this particular seminary. And her mom said, oh my, they evidently don't know that you got a D in English composition when you were in college. And she said, well, mom, mom, I think they don't care that I got a D in English composition when I was a freshman in college. And she goes, well, we won't tell, honey. Don't worry. We won't tell them. You just go ahead and do your job. It's, it's hard sometimes. It's hard not to feel like the people that you think that you can rely on the most, that you trust the most, it's, it's hard for them not to understand why it is that you're doing what you're doing and, and how it is that what you're doing is making a difference in the world. They want to keep you in a box that they've, that they've known you and, and, and the limitations that they've put you in. And, and it says that Jesus could do no deeds of power there except he cured a few people. Okay, that's kind of a big deal. But, 
But he's somehow not able to change their world with the good news of God, or at least he doesn't feel like he is. And it says he is amazed at their unbelief. Now that seems to be an independent story in and of itself, but for the first time I, I decided, I, I think there's a connection between what happens there and then the very next thing he does is he calls the disciples to him who have witnessed the miracles he, he has done, who, who have heard his instructions and his teaching in parables, and he begins to send them out two by two. And the fact that that follows immediately on his experience in his hometown makes me wonder if it occurs to him that not everyone is going to be able to hear his voice with objectivity. Not, not everyone is going to, be, uh, to, to find themselves intrigued by or, or to have an appeal toward the way he's putting God's word, the way he's offering instructions. And that in fact, as a, as a single person out there with a single voice, he's not going to get to as many people as, as together they might. And somehow in the midst of that, he decides he needs colleagues, he needs partners, he needs a team. Maybe part of that also has to do with an understanding that, that in order to endure, in order to persevere with this good news, in the face of discouragement and confrontation and adversity, that what he needs are people around him, a community. Strength that comes from those he knows he can trust. Those he knows will share his experiences those he's willing to offer responsibility to. Because otherwise, maybe he realizes that discouragement may be something that while he might be able to withstand it, he might begin to lose some of his passion or some of his courage. We sort of find Paul in the same place in 2 Corinthians today. As Pastor Cheryl says, this is part of what's considered a, a Paul's severe letter to the believers in Corinth. And, and, he, and now he's sort of having a, a little bit of a recalcitrant heart. He's sort, of, he's sort of feeling badly about how severe he's been with them. But he says that, in fact, he, he's, he's been kind of beaten down by having to defend himself against their relating to him of super apostles who've come by, who've been more persuasive, who've maybe been stronger, who haven't had that thorn in the flesh like he talked about last week. And he says in verse 5 of this seventh chapter, as we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest and we were afflicted on every side. Disputes without and fears within. You know what that feels like. That, that everyone around you that you're trying to help, everyone around you uh, that, that you're trying to hold your integrity with, that you're trying to do the, the honest and good thing, and there's pressure from everyone else. Why are you doing this? This isn't going to get you ahead. It's not going to get your company ahead. Uh, uh, holding the truth and, and, and holding fairness in the midst of a marriage that's, that's beginning to fracture, and, and, and there's pressure around you to just give in and seek revenge and, and do all those things that somehow inside you know you don't want to do. And your body is tired. Disputes without and fears within. What if they're right? And then Paul says, and the consoler of the downcast, God who is the consoler of the downcast, consoled us by bringing us Titus. And not only consoled us with his presence, but with the consolations he offered us that there were some of you Corinthians <laughs> who longed to see me, who mourned at the, at the defeat and the despair that I was feeling, and who were encouraged by my zeal. Paul needed a partner for strength, for consolation. Jesus needed partners for strength and consolation. And Jesus knew that they needed each other. He, it wasn't by mistake he sent them out two by two. And what he said was, look, it's not going to matter if you take a whole bunch of stuff with you. In fact, I don't want you to do that. That's not what will protect you. Rely on each other. And if you get to a place 
maybe like Jesus in his own synagogue, when you get to a place where they will not welcome you and they don't want to hear what you say, he doesn't tell them to condemn them, he doesn't tell them to seek revenge, he doesn't tell them to be sarcastically bitter on their way out the door, he says simply shake the dust off your feet and move on. Don't, don't take the baggage with you. Don't take the resentment with you. Don't, don't take this, this distorted view that all human beings are going to be like the ones who don't and, or are not ready yet to hear the good news. Simply shake the dust off and move on. Do you, do you know what the second thing is we're testing? That, that, that supervisor of the academy said to me that night in the darkness as the cadets continued to struggle with these would-be attackers. The second thing we're testing is if in the middle of this struggle, they realize, I need to get help. That at some point, my strength will wear out. And so unless I take the risk of believing that I can leave one hand on the gun to keep it in its holster, and somehow get my other hand up to my microphone, which will connect me to the police department, to my brothers and sisters. If I can get my hand up to that mic and give the call, then it won't be survival on my own. I will suddenly have help. He says, that's what happens when you hear us ring the bell. He said, the others will pass. But when you hear the bell ring, that's when we know. They've had the will to survive and they've known they need to take the risk to use a hand to call for help. I wonder if in our struggle to survive through this pandemic, if we've forgotten how much we need each other how much we need a village to raise all of us. <laughs> how much we need to be a community. In order to do the, God, the vision God has for us, we may very well survive on our own. Jesus could have survived on his own. Paul could have survived on his own. But I wonder if we catch the vision that Jesus had, that Paul had, that they needed that consolation, they needed that strength, they needed that courage to take the risk to realize that with partners, with colleagues, sharing the journey, they would be able to endure and maybe not just survive, but thrive. I believe that's what God wants for us coming out of this time of sheltering at home and, and isolation. It's easier to do that. It sort of at least feels like. But let me tell you what I'm hearing. We will continue to offer worship online, but let me tell you what I'm hearing from those who are venturing out into in-person worship. You know, Pastor, I'll probably continue to listen to you online off and on, but being here reminds me that worship at home is flat. I'm like, oh, I'm flat in a net. You can take me anywhere you go. <laughs> and they said, okay, Pastor, whatever. <laughs> Being in community makes a difference. I think Jesus learned that when he went home. I think Paul learned that as he confronted those who were questioning his authority. Those cadets learned that that night to reach out for help. May we reach out to one another as well. Amen.